Welcome everyone to the YP podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Marissa Gaston and I am the Young Professionals Director at the Washington Policy Center, where the mission of young professionals is to educate, engage, and empower the next generation of free market leaders here in Washington state. Again, thanks so much for jumping into this conversation with us on vaccine passports and the policies surrounding that in Washington state. I'm on this call with my co-host, Robin Antoine, who I am delighted to introduce. She is our part-time uh, YP coordinator based in Spokane. And our guest today is WPC's Center for Small Business Director, uh, Mark Harmsworth. And I'm gonna turn it over to them briefly to just introduce themselves, say hello, uh, and then we'll jump into questions and content. Robin. Hello everyone, this is Robin. I'm super excited to be on the podcast today and get to talk about um, some hot issues. And my name's Mark Armsworth and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And we're gonna have some uh, interesting discussion on uh, vaccine passports, I believe. Absolutely. So I'll just jump in with the first question and then um, pass it over to Robin, but just to get us going, um, Mark, I wonder if you could just kind of give us a sense of the policy right now in Washington state um, around employers collecting vaccine info from their employees. Well, the governor under his authority with emergency orders has um, asked the Department of Labor and Industries or LNI to collect medical information to see who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. And the, the goal of this is really to increase the vaccine uh, percentage levels in the state so that um, we can get back to normal. Now, what LNI has done is written up some rules that require employers to ask their employees for this information. So every employer has to now have a process in place so that when LNI shows up, they can inspect the data that's being collected and the employer has to sign or collect signed attestation forms, which is a word that's really hard to say quickly, from their employees um, on their vaccine status. So whether they've been vaccinated or whether they haven't been vaccinated for inspection by LNI. And that data is then used to determine uh, what the vaccine levels are in the state by labor and industries. Um, it obviously has a lot of implications from a medical perspective and a privacy perspective. And uh, I think we're going to be digging into those as we get into this conversation today. Absolutely. And just before we kind of pivot over to the next question set, could you, um, could you touch on kind of the relationship uh, between HIPAA, ADA, um, kind of the interface between LNI and employers. And and quick side note, uh, LNI is labor and industries for those of you like me who had to look it up. Yeah, so uh, HIPAA, which is the federal uh, medical statute that was passed many years ago, and HIPAA is a, a law that uh, makes a company protect our medical data in a specific way. There's other statutes out there as well. Uh, PII, PCI are two others that you may have heard of. PII is um, private information. Um, just think of your name, address, and phone number. PCI is credit card information. So PCI statutes typically um, regulate banks, building societies, and, and other um, financial institutions. And then um, HIPAA regulates hospitals, doctors, medical processors. Now, HIPAA specifically, if you're collecting medical information, um, classifies certain types of companies and businesses as what's called a covered entity. And then there's another type of business called a business associate. So if you are a HIPAA covered entity, that means you're collecting and dealing with medical information and you fall under the HIPAA statute, then any business that you do business with has to be uh, in an agreement with you or under contract. And that contract is called a business associate contract, which um, enables you to move data back and forth. Now, Labor and Industries, L&I, is a covered entity because they collect medical information for medical claims. That's the whole point of Labor and Industries insurance is if you fall off of a roof while doing your job and you file a claim with L&I, you know, obviously L&I gets involved with the medical side of things. So it creates a sort of gray area. Now, an employer that's collecting certain medical information from their employees is not considered a covered entity if it's not their primary business under the statute. And so this is where it kind of gets a little gray. 
a employer can ask an employee for their uh, medical information, um, but they're not allowed to do anything with it other than store it. Um, and if the employee doesn't give consent for that data to be shared with anybody else, um, it gets them into a situation where uh, l and might show up wanting to look and inspect the medical records for the vaccine status, and the employer is unable to give this information to l um, and i and expose the, the medical privacy or violate the medical privacy of their employees because they don't have consent to share it. And that's where things got sticky. You know, a lot of folks in the media have been talking about, well, it's not a HIPAA violation. Um, there's also another statute that could be violated here, which is the American Disabilities Act, which is the ADA Act, um, because that talks about medical privacy. So um, just as an aside, if you wanted to get yourself in trouble with ADA as an employer, you would say to your employee, what is your vaccine status? And then you'd do a follow up question to ask them, well, where did you get it done? Or what do you think of that? And that would put you in violation of the American Disabilities Act immediately. So there's a whole bunch of rules around this that by requiring employers to collect this information, the state, l &I, has now put them in a very precarious situation where an employer that may not have been collecting this medical information in the past has now got medical data on their employees that they've now got to protect and potentially not expose or expose to l and I. And it raises a whole set of questions on medical privacy and what the type of data that we should be storing as employers. And really the root question is, why does l and I even need it in the first place? That would be a question I would ask. So going off of that, talking about like private information, what other kinds of data do you think will end up being on these vaccine passports? Well, they're only the, the employer can ask you pretty much anything they want. You don't, as an employee, have to answer. Uh, the consequences of you not answering might be different depending on what the employees decided they want to do. Um, I mean, the employer could say, well, you know, we're going to terminate you, but the uh, statute that LI put out explicitly said that they weren't allowed to do that. So this is what I'm saying. It's it's kind of gray in, in that if you as an employee say, I don't want to give you my vaccine status, then the employer really doesn't have any legal standing to do anything else at that point. Um, but uh, they could start collecting other information as well. It sets a really bad precedent when a state agency can tell an employer what type of data that needs to be collected from their employees. Now, we're talking about uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. What happens if an agency in the future decides that it wants to collect um, your polio or your MMR or uh, status or whether you've had um, a, a, you know, some kind of surgery or something like that? Because that type of data, and this is where you run foul of the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, could be used to discriminate against you as an employee. If you were in a labor intensive job where you were expected to lift um, 50 to 100 pounds on a regular basis, and you were, uh, and the employer came to you and said, Hey, have you ever had surgery on your back? And then they found out that you had, and then they dismissed you because they thought that you wouldn't better perform your job well. Or worse, during the hiring process, they ask you that and then decline to hire you even though you're a qualified candidate, then you, you end up in this horrible situation where this information is now being collected. So you can kind of see the slippery slope that we're going down here where um, when a state agency is asking that information. What if l &I decides that it wants to ask you if you're a smoker, for example, and then use that to increase the rates that they're charging employee employers for your insurance? Or if you've got vertigo and you're roofing person and they decide to increase the rate so you can see how this could be a, a really bad situation it's just generally it's a bad idea to be doing this anyway so as a policy expert are you concerned about the precedent that this policy sets yeah absolutely and we sort of just touched on that there is where they're collecting a lot of information um, and then using that information to potentially discriminate against employees or or um, have adverse actions against them. Um, what if you've 
if you're uh, obese and your employer decides it doesn't want to insure you or it increases your insurance rates because um, the, the potential for increased medical costs. Um, so you can see where that's going. The other thing that could happen here is you start creating these records um, where um, it, employers and other agencies are able then to inspect your medical history, ne not necessarily with your consent, um, especially if you've got these cards. There, an example of this was the WashDOT um, policy that we don't believe they've adopted. We're going to find out shortly. But when we first asked them, their forms included a provision to require their employees, once they'd received their vaccines for COVID-19, to wear a badge prominently on the outside of their clothing on their employee badge that indicated that they received the vaccine. And this was on display for everybody to see. Um, that is an absolute violation of your medical privacy because now you're being forced as a condition of employment to wear a badge that everyone can inspect at any time and decide if they want to interact with you because you've been vaccinated or not. Where does that stop? Um, you know, I'm a I'm a an employee that uh, has some condition, and here's my badge to say I've got this condition, and people start avoiding you because of that. So. It, it, it creates a whole new uh, class of discrimination um, that is uh, it's just outrageous, to be honest, um, where your behavior or your personal private medical choices are now on display for everybody to see. And it's, you know, people will say, well, that's kind of extreme, but WashDOT is, a you know, the Department of Transportation, Washington State Department of Transportation is a great example of this. They didn't think twice about requiring their employees to wear badges to show their vaccine status. And that is uh, a violation of your medical privacy. Mm -hmm. And I know currently there, there is a lot of buzz around the idea of an actual passport, a, a vaccine passport, as, as we've said, um, you know, for example, traveling to the EU from the US right now, you're required to provide evidence of a COVID vaccination status. Um, but I wonder, in Washington state, at this point, are we looking at, at an actual passport document right now? Or is it is it currently, from a policy perspective, manifesting as this one particular question from employers to employees? I think it's towards the latter because the um, the population here uh, in the U.S. and we have a constitution that protects us from uh, over government uh, intrusion in our lives, but the state really can't. It, it's the same issue that we've had with contract tracing where if you remember last year, the state issued guidelines to businesses that had required them to, to record everyone who entered their establishment and contact information. And the idea was that if somebody reported positive for COVID, that everyone that had entered that restaurant or retail establishment could be contacted and then potentially put into quarantine. Well, uh, that's none of the government's business where I go and do my uh, shopping or where I eat. And that is an immense invasion of my privacy from uh, for me to conduct commerce. And that's a, actually a constitutional violation. So they backed off on that pretty quickly when they realized they'd overstepped the mark. Um, but they did realize that they can't ask people sp uh, directly to give this information, but they were able to start collecting some of this through businesses. And you may have seen some businesses having that form as an optional, hey, who are you? And and um, what do you, you know? We're going to record your information. And some people gave their information quite willingly, which surprises me because of the um, you, you don't know where that information is going. You think about when you sign up for a mailing list or you sign up for a new service, you'll notice there's a uh, privacy declaration that that talks about how the data is going to be used, how it's going to be stored, and this is part of the PII, PCI, and HIPAA standards. Uh, they're regulated by two other standards, which is ISO 27001 or NIST 800 if it's a military establishment or contract. And these statutes are very complex and they govern the use of this data. So when you give your data away freely with no understanding, that data is in the wild at that point. It can be used for anything. And that's how this stuff gets on the dark web and, and gets used by people in, in, um, in nefarious ways. So the state is using LNI as an extension, uh, a um, 
uh, effectively an enforcement arm because it can't do it directly. And plus, you know, practically the state can't run around with a bunch of police enforcing these rules. It just rings sort of, you know, an authoritarian state and it just can't do that because of the constitution. So they're sort of circumventing it by doing this, by making it incredibly painful if you want to do business with somebody and they require you to have a vaccine passport. So that's actually kind of what I was going to ask next is what will happen if companies don't comply with this? So L&I has the power um, to uh, revoke your business license or potentially even fine you. Uh, so you, you saw businesses during the lockdown, there were some gyms down in Puyallup that uh, continued to open despite being told to be closed, but they did open and operate under CDC guidelines. l and went in and said, you can't open. They said, yes, we can. You can't stop us from opening because the constitution guarantees us the right to conduct commerce unimpeded. And we're operating safely according to CDC guidelines. We're using social distancing, we're using masks and all the cleansing um, stuff that came with that. And Al and I fined them $40,000 anyway, and they appealed and the fine was overturned because Al and I's enforcement comes out of workplace safety, not out of enforcing the governor's rules in this particular case. So businesses that don't collect this information um, could get into trouble because under the guise of workplace safety, L and I can claim that the unvaccinated individuals are are potentially higher risk to the vaccinated individuals. Who, if you've been vaccine, if you had the vaccine, you shouldn't technically have any major side effects, even if you do catch it, because it doesn't protect you 100 percent anyway. But that's the that's the difference, I think, between what happened with this gym and what they can do to employers today. So you you may see fines, you may see businesses getting shut down, uh, particularly bars and restaurants. They can have their liquor licenses revoked and their um, serving uh, licenses revoked, which basically takes them out of business. And could you speak a little bit to um, the impact to businesses just amongst employers and employees? Yeah, if you think as an employer about this carefully, and I've, I've talked to many employers, it really violates your trust with your employees and it creates a really nasty environment because you've got some employees who will be quite willing to tell you if they've been vaccinated. Some will be willing to tell you they haven't been vaccinated, but there will be others that will look at this and go, it's none of their business if I've been vaccinated for COVID-19 and they'll refuse to answer. And so you, you really put strain on that relationship. I, I say you destroy trust. It creates, in some cases, a hostile environment um, because you can imagine some employees feeling that that's an invasion of privacy and they would be right. And, and then when that data is shared with l and where's it going? We haven't heard anything about what l and wants to use this data for. Are they going to collect it? Are they just going to inspect it? Are they going to build a big database of who's been vaccinated and who hasn't? and then start harassing you to get vaccines. I mean, we've seen uh, more of a carrot approach right now with uh, the, um, the money they're giving away if you get vaccine, the lottery money they're giving away, which incidentally is our tax dollars being given away. Wouldn't it be better to use that for something else that we're dealing with right now, like homelessness? Just a thought, um, but you'll see that too. So it really erodes, especially if you've got a good trust culture in your company, it, it erodes that trust count, uh, that trust and that is um, that that's none of LNI's business what's going on that in inside a company's operations. Definitely. So with all the collected information, who has access to all of this information? Well, that's the point. Um, we don't know. What's LNI doing with it? We don't know if they're going to collect it or not. What are the uh, state agencies going to do? If you're a public employee and you're working for uh, the auditor or the Department of Transportation or any of the other uh, departments down at the state, what's the state doing with this data? Um, nobody knows. An employer, at least you can say, I'm not going to give this data out to anyone but L and I when they force me to. Um, and then I'm going to keep it locked in this cabinet or I'm going to keep it secured in this encrypted password database thing. But we don't know what's going on. And that's a problem. This is a whole new area which we've never really explored before with state, uh, with these emergency powers, and it has not been thought through. And there are perilous problems here. If um, uh, this data gets leaked, 
you know, he's got you, you're going to have your name and I'm assuming address and your vaccine status and what other data they come up with, they want to start collecting in the future. That's private. How do you, how do you protect that data? And how do you deal with this at the federal level as well? If another agency comes along and wants to talk to this, so nobody knows. And that's why this is a really, really bad idea. Governor Jay Inslee was recently telling Washingtonians that if you get the vaccine, you'll be entered into a, a lottery for, for a prize. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, I think that's, I think that that's what was happening. And pe some people raised flags and said, well, wait, how, how am I automatically entered? You must be storing my data. Um, so just to, to your point. Yeah. And the, the state's been, um, collecting this data and putting it sort of aggregating it into a database I'm assuming somewhere it's pulling it from it Department of Health vaccine so when you get a vaccine they record that you got it um, I, uh, I don't know if everyone has signed a privacy statement when they got their vaccine because that data was collected that's private data Department of Health I'm assuming is a covered entity under HIPAA since it's collecting this information so what did it do and what did it expose to um, people when it was doing this vaccines. And I bet you there was no provision in there when they were collecting that data that said, we're going to use your data for a lottery. I bet there was a, a very broad statement if they did anything that said, hey, we're going to collect this data and use use it however we shall please. So um, if, if you didn't sign anything when you had your vaccine to, uh, privacy statement for your medical information, then the state's got your data and it can use it however it wants. So you've mentioned all these other companies and agencies who, I mean, if anyone stands to gain financially from all these policies. Well, the, obviously the vaccine producing companies stand to gain a lot of money um, from these vaccines. I know they've, some of these companies have obviously reduced the cost and they've got no legal liability because that was waived. So there's, uh, there's certainly an immense amount of money there. And we've seen that in the value of those companies in the last year or so. As that's gone up. Um, from a state perspective, um, I don't know if the, the state's not going to make any money specifically on it and anyway, but you know, this administration is spending money, as you know, our budget went up 10 billion this year and they increased our taxes by creating an income tax and capital gains and a whole bunch of different things as well. So they're they're obviously making more money out of the the actual pandemic itself, not the the vaccines. But I would say from a just from the uh, distribution, you've got a lot of medical facilities and pharmaceutical companies that are certainly going to make more money. And I'm not against these guys making money. Don't hear that. But um, certainly they will financially benefit from this situation. Um, another note, is there any... Um... Is there any distinction, is there any kind of stark difference between how these policies might impact a contractor versus uh, an employee? Yeah, so an employer can ask their employees for this information, but if you are an employer that has a series of 1099 contractors, those are people that come and work at a company temporarily, might be a few days at a time, maybe a few hours that they work at your company. And now uh, LNI requires you to ask them in their uh, your medical information. Co typically, Ellen, uh, typically contracts with 1099s are specific to the type of work that you're doing. So you have a master services agreement that says, I'm going to interact with you in this way. I won't violate your data and I'm going to operate in this way. And then you have a service, a SAO or a services operating agreement or something like that that says, this is the work I shall perform. And it's a relatively simple contract. It'll say, I will do this work in 10 hours and you will pay me this much money. And so an employer now has to ask them, oh, by the way, thanks for the contracts. What's your vaccine status? And they're going to have to put that in a database. Oh my gosh. I mean, those are, there's no employment agreement. There's no signed HR agreement between those independent contractors and that company. And if I was an independent contract, and I am in many cases, I would uh, refuse to answer that question because it's not of that company's business at that point. Now, the company may decide not to hire me as a result. And that's getting back to this discrimination thing. Um, and they're within their right not to hire me. But, you know, it, that's a horrible situation. You've created two classes of individuals. And uh, you, 
you know, be operating differently based on vaccine status. You know, there was a, a movie back in the night, I think it was in the 90s called Gattaca uh, with uh, Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman, if I remember correctly. And it postulated um, uh, that in the future, it was a sci-fi movie and I'm a sci-fi guy. So it postulated in the future that you would be selected for your job based on your DNA and your um and your up you know your upbringing but the your genetic makeup and so parents started to genetically modify baby's dna which now obviously is possible at the time the movie wasn't like that but um and it creates this dystopian society where when you're born you know what job you're going to have based on your dna so you know obviously the vaccine stuff's not the same way but it made me it reminded me of that movie because it created two classes of individuals those that were vaccined in our case in this situation here and ones that aren't so um whatever the result of this is uh, you create two situations i had some friends go down to the mariners game just a couple of days ago and they were placed in a different area in the stadium because they've been vaccinated and others around them had not and so you've created this uh, this horrible discrimination and, and segregation in our society now based on vaccine status. And what's the difference between a COVID-19 vaccine and a polio vaccine or an MMR vaccine, or, you know, potentially if they get there, an AIDS vaccine, you know, are we going to start discriminating based on those now? Um, it's just a terrible situation to be in. So with that, how do you think this is going to affect the job market and unemployment? Well, I really hope that um, cooler heads prevail and they back off of this, um, you know, checking the vaccine thing, because that obviously returns things to pretty much normal. If they go down the road where uh, they allow folks to discriminate or segregate based on vaccine vaccination. Um, and remember, these these vaccines are still experimental. They haven't been fully field tested yet. Um, then. Yeah, you know, you're going to create a segregated workplace where some people are going to be unable to get jobs, even though they may be qualified or the best person for the job um, because they've not received or they choose for medical reasons not to receive the vaccine. This isn't just a I'm not going to get a vaccine. This is I may not be able to get that vaccine. And so you will end up with, um, I suspect, in some cases, employers that will require uh, unvaccinated individuals to continue following the CDC guidelines of six foot social distancing and wearing masks. And even if they're in the workplace, it will um, limit their ability to uh, to do well at what they're doing. Um, you, it's somewhat it reminds me a little bit of the old days with remote workers and people in person. It's very much more easy to have a meeting in person, although I think we've sort of handled that quite well in the last year now with Zoom meetings. But if you were on the call and everyone will testify to this, if you've ever sat on a phone call in a meeting and you're just on audio, you're at a distinct disadvantage. And that's what's going to happen with these masks if we go down this road. So for as employers, um, yeah, you're faced with a decision of, do I now have a policy to discriminate or do I just say, you know what, I'm just going to treat everyone exactly the same way and everyone has to wear masks vaccinated or not. And then some employers are doing that instead. They just don't want to deal with the mess and the trust issues and the discrimination or segregation of their employees. So they just require everyone to wear masks. And so, um, which, you know, when does that stop uh, once the state says it can or not? So uh, difficult, very difficult situation. And we need to be past this. And we do not need to be collecting this information and discriminating and segregating our employees. And this really leads into my last question, which is, do you have a future forecast for how these policies might, uh, you know, evolve or take shape in the next months or even years? Yeah, my fear is that this is used as a precedent for a lot of other uh, really bad policies where uh, the state will come in and go, oh, OK, so it's flu season. So this year it's not quite as aggressive as COVID-19. And so. But we don't want anyone else to be infected, which is none of the government's business, by the way. Um, but uh, we're going to impose a new emergency order on you and lock you down just for the next few weeks. So you can see this becoming an annual occurrence. You could see the state trying to use this 
for other things as well. I mean, we're talking about a COVID-19 vaccine, but could the state come in and require you to have other vaccines for stuff in the future? We don't know what's being invented or not yet. So, you know, as far as what's coming down the pipe, could they require you to carry a vaccine passport in the form of a document or, you know, in some countries, even a chip that they inject with your medical history that they can scan at a scene of an accident. But again, it's, that's not the state's issue. So what I see happening this year, I think we will get past this in the next 60 to 90 days and we'll figure out um, kind of how this is going to play out. And then uh, hopefully uh, we can get back to normal. But I really hope that the legislature next year puts a curb on the governor's emergency powers and any decisions that are made by the governor have to be brought back to the legislature for ratification. I really hope so. Mark, Robin, thank you so much for such a valuable conversation. Mark, thank you for taking the time to join us on the podcast. Robin, thank you for co-hosting with me. Um, that wraps it up for this month's YP podcast. Again, please check out the Young Professionals if you're not already a member of our community. Um, you can go to at WPC underscore Young Professionals on Instagram and explore some of our work. You can listen to our other podcasts. And as always, you can explore the Washington Policy Center's eight different research centers uh, and look at the a multitude of amazing policy work that uh, Mark and our other colleagues in the research department have put out. So with that, thank you again for taking the time to listen to our podcast, for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Robin. And I'll we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.